Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and MBs. Welcome to Worry Desho covering Vinland Saga. I'm Shaden, and I'm here to tell you it's London calling from the faraway town. Now war is declared and battle will come down. Didn't quite sing as well as I otherwise could have done, but that's why you need to get me liquored up first. But joining me as always, fellow band member in many respects, the Soul Doctor. What's going on, everybody? Hi. <laughs> how, are, how are you? I hope all is well. Uh, I missed you guys. Everybody. Like, I miss doing this, even though we've only been away for like a day longer than usual. I'm excited to talk about anime. Because <laughs> I love anime. Anime is great. And you guys are great. So, Doc's been settled like, you know, uh, you used to say I constantly talking into a mirror yesterday about long points on the existential nature of war and violence and human condition and all all that other juicy stuff that makes things like Vinland Saga great. I mean, uh, but no, we're actually going to talk about it to you all this time. Look, you want to know the real story. The real story is, for an inordinate amount of time this weekend, I had to hang out with relatives who were not interested in letting me watch anime, read manga, or talk about said items. So it's just it's pent up. It's just like waiting to, to seep out. It's been... It's been uh, forcibly hibernating. It, yeah, it, it, I, it's, I yeah. can just I can just see Doc there, like at the dinner table, and you're all having a nice lovely meal, talking about whatever's going on locally, local football team, all that kind of crap. And then he's just there, and suddenly springs up and he says, "But what about the fucking <laughs> anime Vikings?" <laughs> it's, it's right. When are we going to talk about them? Thorkel. Yeah, are... <laughs> That's what do you guys think about Thorkel? I need to know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll we'll discuss him soon enough. We'll we'll be covering you know one half of the comedy duo that is for Keenan and for Kel. I was, <laughs> I was gonna ask you, does does, <laughs> does Thorkel love orange soda? That's like the I think that's he a does. fucking I think poll. He does. I'm making it a poll right now, like immediately. This, this I think is gonna be a poll. I think he does, and I'm so sorry for that joke. It's also it's exposed great. how ancient we both are. <laughs> Holy it's shit. Incredible. I remember being in primary school and there were rumors that I think it was Keenan had died or something like that. Oh. That was a thing for a while. Oh, yeah. And then he Even ended up you on know Saturday that. Night Live for the years. Well, good for him. Good for him. I mean, I think Forkel, as in Vinland Saga Forkel, would be good on Saturday Night Live. He seems like a lot of fun. If only because he would show off, you know, his uh, extreme lock throwing ability, which we will be discussing in great detail coming up soon. Do not worry, folks. Uh, so anyway, for the moment though, uh, we're going to of course bring up the polls from last time, the ones which basically exposed me as old man yells at cloud, because I have been keeping an eye on them, I must say. <laughs> um, although there is a point I want to discuss about one of them before we actually begin, but uh, I'll wait for Docs to get those up now and just talk about uh, how they turned out. I'm still... Listen, I have to do this poll right. It must be credible and good. We have all the right choices. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a poll about Keenan and Kel, basically. There's nothing <laughs> credible about it. Fucking hell, man. <laughs> Alright, I'll post it in the chat in a second. But okay, to wrap up our episode 8 uh, dealings. Here are the polls from episode 8, titled Beyond the Edge of the Sea. Umi no hate no hate. Uh, Does Vinland Saga's message of war being a cruel, consuming force used for expansionist reasons and its opposition thereof, fall a little bit flat due to its basis in real-world history and the events that follow in actual history. <clears throat> Pardon me. I I've wasn't very good at writing one now, I'll confess. That's my bad. I'm being attacked by the ghosts of Vikings as I try to read this poll. Oh, I, I um, thought you meant my keyboard. <laughs> so, 83% uh, of the audience say no. That the message old man yells at cloud. The, the message, old man yells at cloud. <laughs> the message isn't undermined by uh, history continuing to play out as like you know a theater of war. Um, they don't feel it undermines the message, and I would tend to agree, uh, as we discussed last week. The next poll had Askeladd not taunted him with Thorfinn have won the duel and killed him. Uh, Sixty-eight percent say no, he would not have, and. Mm. On that one, it's a little bit closer. 68-32 is not a huge disparity, though it is decisive. I'm not as decisive about it. I think it's more of an open question, personally. Mm. Well, the funny thing is, I've been thinking on that question since I put it out there last week, and for me, when it comes to this kind of revenge plot, 
what are the factors that stop the protagonist from exacting their revenge? Uh, the first one is the question of skill and capability. Uh, more broadly termed, it's just basically they don't have the means to do so. Mm -hmm. And that could be simply that they lack the equipment to do so, the material elements, or it could be skill and competence. Like, if you've ever seen the very first Zorro movie, the classic 90s, 90s one with Antonio Banderas, he wanted to kill the captain, couldn't fucking do it because he couldn't hold the sword right, he didn't know which way it went, you know. And funnily enough, he also got simply basted, you know, by... Uh... Didn't know which way it went. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, he, he... It would surprise me from my memory of the film if that was true. Uh, but he also got simply basted by Amnesty Hopkins, uh, you know, like making insults by his brother when they were trained. Why is this relevant? Because that's the second part of it. Um, that it's also then about mentality. Do you have the will to do so? Or is your mindset on revenge like stopping you from doing it? You know, because you fail as a result of overextending yourself, being too angry, too emotional. Or is simply are your emotions too burdensome? So for me, the reason I asked that question was because I'm of the opinion that I think Thorfinn has the skill to kill Ascalon, mm. but he lacks the mentality to do so. And I'm not saying the story can't do both simultaneously. I, mean, I did mention the Zorro one, which was the big, like, you know, goofy pop conflict, though it was. That does have a similarity here. Uh, but I'm interested, I'd be interested to hear why people think more that he can't physically overpower Ascalon, because I felt like that the previous episode settled mm -hmm. pretty conclusively that he could. It's just that then he was based into it by him saying, eh, your dad's a wiener. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel, I feel the same. I mean, Askeladd is definitely looking, looking his age there <laughs> a couple times in the last couple episodes. Well, he but, certainly uh, does in this one, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting poll result. Um, he's still got more hair than me, though, so he's doing better than... That's true. Although it is falling out. Uh, at least of what so part mine. of space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, the next is there a next poll? I thought. Oh no, that's it. There were the two. Oh, and these are just retweets. I see. I thought there were four polls. Okay, beautiful. So those are the polls, and uh, I will now uh, paste in the uh, incredible, you know, stupendous. Uh, orange and wonderful poll uh, into the the chat. For oh God! Are we week. are we going to start comparing Finland sagas to other nineties properties? Are we going to compare this to Say by the Bell at some point? Oh, Is that God. how we're going to end up having this go? I, I hope so. <laughs> I I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm quite ready for that. To be quite honest. Uh, but I'm sure we'll find out as the series progresses. Who is the AC right. Slater of Vinland Saga? <laughs> Who's the Screech more like? <laughs> yeah. That was bad thinking about. Do anyway. You, so do, uh, you, do you want to hear about the episode director really quick? Yes, please. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, sip beer. I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, this is the last week I'm going to mention that Kenta Ihara is credited as the co-writer, the co-head writer uh, with Hiroshi Seko. Because it's been the case since episode five. So this is the fifth week running. Um, and there are now more episodes in which that is the case than not. So until that changes, I'm going to leave that one uh, unsaid going forward. And uh, this is a tough name for me to pronounce. Who's the episode director? Uh, John Smith. Yep. That you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really. I've been working on that one and just fucking it up. And you, you saved just, just me. like your Viking accent. You say, <laughs> "Oh, that was, are you? That was are you ready? No, no, no. I, I have it now. Are you? I, I'm, I am ready. Go on. I actually got it. I, this is it. This is the one. If you're tuning into this for the first time, for some reason or other, you know, no, never mind. I'm not going to explain this fucking joke. I'm not. That will be bad. So what I am going to do is I'm going to show you the fruits of my labor and demonstrate that I, in fact, can do a correct Viking accent, okay? You've told God. me that I've been wrong before, but I've got it now. Is this like your attempt to prove the Earth is flat? Because okay. it seems like it might be futile. <laughs> All right, here we go. This oh, will be like a dead ringer for, uh, for Thorkel here, right? All right. What, Japanese then? Hello, it's me, the Viking <laughs> Commander. 
and I am here to raid your village. Oi! <laughs> Hand over your women and your gold. And you sound you like got, old Valgalian. <laughs> if who is that a Viking that I don't know of? Yes, well, absolutely. <laughs> look, if you've got any legs of lamb, I'll eat them for free. After I loot your treasury, now I'm off to do that. Don't get in my way if you don't want to be shot full of holes. Right, here I go. I'm off to loot, loot the town. Looting is in progress. Loot, <laughs> loot, loot. Is, All right, I've looted those, the town. I've for those looted who the this village. Is like, this is like when those you read on those newspaper instances of like you know reports like of a uh, people on mobility scooters stealing someone's handbag or wallet. Like, <laughs> aha! You can't catch me. I'm getting away at the top speed of four miles an hour. But yeah, you, you sounded like Vargelia, but like ninety-five years old. <laughs> Damn! Sure, sure, so I, I got it wrong thing. again. God. So. Is it an improvement, quote unquote? Maybe. <laughs> is it an improvement, Theowulf? It's, he just said no for some reason in the chat. I don't know I think why, he was running but... something earlier. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. But no, so, no, no. Uh, so the the director of episode the ninth is uh, uh, Michiru Itabisashi. Itabisashi, I think. Itabisashi. So Michiru uh, looks like they were involved uh at a pretty similar level throughout their kind of uh career thus far um oh well actually you know what mm -hmm. we've talked about this person before for they uh oh they sounds ominous no 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 no. it's good they directed episode four of vinland saga also so they're back oh, oh right oh back in the god <laughs> no nothing bad uh, I, thought back. Gonna, I thought you were going to say that they were like the senior production, you know, consultant or whatever on Gazi's wing or some turgid piece of shit like that. Right. Because that's how right. it always goes every time you go like that. Like, wait, where have I, where have I seen this? <laughs> oh my god. Original concept. I mean, I've had, Psychic Wars. I've had bad experience <laughs> of that recently where I'm just like, there's some talented people who've worked on some utter shit. And I, they have my sympathies. Yeah. And they also don't. They, it kind right. of alternates. Stroding his empathy, if you want to call it that. Well, um, so they, uh, like I said, they kind of have been mostly an episode director here and there hmm. for different things. It looks like the most experience that they have with a single project is directing four episodes of a television anime called Love Rice. Um, Ooh, is that a, uh, I was going to say, is that a, you know, food cooking show? Is that like, you know... Is it the equivalent of the Keekin where this gentleman opens a pack of rice and it turns into a waifu? Five new rice-inspired students attempt to supplant bread as the popular grain at the school. Oh. <laughs> well, it's better than, better than the uh, spin-off that I envisioned, that's for sure, and certainly far less horrifying. Do they, do Should... they have a mentor named Uncle Ben? Not Spider-Man. <laughs> <the> <laughs> I wish. Uh, the, there's a couple of you know, the new students form the Love Rice unit and challenge themselves to perform at the Harvest Show. Uh, oh, of course it's called that. <laughs> to show the delicious appeal of rice grains. Um, Do they stare into the camera at any point and go, you can try this too. And they hold up like a microwavable rice packet. There, it was... It would uh, surprise me. Apparently popular enough that there is a sequel. Love Rice 2. Uh... <laughs> The, the the first Love Rice aired in 2017. Uh, I've clicked on Love Rice 2 and apparently it's crashed my browser. Nope, nope, it appeared. Uh, <laughs> and there's like almost no information, <laughs> no information about Love Rice 2. Uh, well, uh, obviously it's still <laughs> cooking, so there you go. It's still in the pot. So anyway, yeah, all that to say is that uh, uh, Itabi Sashi uh, has you know done some episode direction a little production advancement not a ton beyond that looks like um someone who comes in uh to direct an episode of your show when like the the people who are over the the projects in a larger creative capacity uh, are focusing on other parts of the project that week need a break from episode direction to do something else that kind of thing so that appears to be the uh the role 
of the director uh, in this stage. But I have to say, like, um, episodes... Director, he's also doing, like, meals and treats for the staff members on Vinland Saga, and they all have to be rice-based. Could, yes. I, I wonder if you keep bringing them in. Like, you know, you've done such a great job on the most recent animation that I felt it would be worthwhile bringing this over rice while you're here. It's got ketchup on it and everything, I promise. Why do you keep feeding this for us? It's breakfast time. <laughs> but that's the whole reason why. There's plenty of vitamins and minerals in this and everything. Oh, Eat your fucking rice, you fucking slaves. <laughs> we love rice. Love it. So yeah, that's uh, that's the director here, uh, Itabi Sashi. Episodes four and nine of Inland Saga, though, which are very good. Mm-hmm. All right, then. <clears throat> so let's talk about the plot of episode nine, The Battle of London Bridge, which... Well, it's a timely day to be having that particular title on, just a little bit further up the road, mind you, but I'll not discuss that here. Uh, anyway, so we pick up where we were off, you know, last time, which was to say that we get to see 4 being 4 on a bridge, you know, murdering the shit out of people and enjoying every second. Um, now, all of the, uh, you know, Danish army are trying to take the bridge, but they're having no real... Uh, Askeladd and Bjorn are on their longboat, just chilling, like they're taking a tourist trip. They're just sat there watching events fall unfold. They know Falkel is up, and Bjorn makes an observation that he's a traitor. Uh, even though um, Askeladd himself points back that we're doing this for the money as much as Falkel apparently is, but make a note of Bjorn saying traitor later for something we'll talk about later. Okay. And so they're having a discussion, like, you know, about, well, what are we going to do about this whole situation? And, you know, eventually Asclad comes with an idea. Hey, Forfin, you know, you, you got me a head once, and I need to add to my growing collection of heads that you've taken in order to get a duel with me. Why add one more to the pot, you know? It beats collecting anime figures. So go to get four Kel's head for me, you little shit. Um, this, by the way, results in an amazing little uh, back and forth between them in which uh, Forfin on the ship's mast throws his dagger through Askeladd's pot of wine, or jug of wine, rather, um, says, I'm going to fucking end you, and then gets it thrown back at him uh, by Askeladd. Again, showing their back and forth here that, you know, for all that Thorfinn could in theory kill him any time, Askeladd can do much the same. Uh, but he says, yeah, go get Farkel's head for me. Easy enough, you can handle that, can't you? Uh, so, <laughs> we have the OP. Yeah, go on, go go grab the head, it's easy. And Oh, get back, get, you, you know, can of milk. Get me a can of milk on the way back as well. Right. Yes. And some beef and some beef jerky. You know, there's a shop around here. Go sort it. Uh, anyway, so before that happens, though, it turns out that uh, Floki's flunkies, or Floki's, I suppose, uh, turn up on a boat, come to give a message to Farkel straight <laughs> from the Kit King. The good ship Moonves. <laughs> Les Moonves <laughs> of CBS. Exactly. And Vikings. So they, they turn up. Uh, Falkel treats him like he's just literally bumped into him on a, at the pub or like, you know, a game of football. Like, hey, how's it going? It's been a while. You look well. Even though you kind of look like Guile from Street Fighter mixed with a bit of Sagat thrown in. What a weird not... love child. What's he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it also turns out none of the men working under Falkel can aim for shit because even though all the other Yomsgard Vikings have got their shields up, Floki's just stood in the middle like a giant bullseye and not one of them actually hit it. I mean, at this rate, you're going to tell me that the ba the guy who shot the king in the head on the Bayo Tapestry did it by shooting backwards. They're but bad. Anyway, Storm they are Academy of Shots. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. They, they are pretty terrible. So yeah, uh, Farkel turns up, and we get a good impression of just how massive this dude is. He makes Dave Bautista look like one of the guys from Revenge of the Nerds. Wow. Oh yeah, I forget. That's not a, a wrestling reference from you. That's a nerd... That's a that's a Guardians of the Galaxy reference. He's still was, a chunky lad. I, I mean, he's still a beefy lad, Dave. Oh, yeah. seems to, even though yeah, I've never no, seen him in wrestling, of really. Yeah. So, uh, trust me, Farkel, like he's he's fucking huge. But yeah, uh, Floki says, "Okay, look, you know, come back, baby, come back." You know, he's doing his whole like holding up the stereo thing, uh, yes. and. Uh, Forkel says in um, Norse or Danish, so the Englishman can't understand him, oh, these guys, they're all shit, but that's why I'm liking this, because it's a challenge. And so I'll just kill you all instead. Because <laughs> Forkel's gonna Forkel, because he don't, you know, give a damn. Yep. It's true. So, he decides that in the most anime thing I think I've seen this show put forward thus far, that he's gonna throw a 
fucking gigantic boulder the size of an SUV onto their longboat. And I love Floki's reaction to this because he's like, hard to left. And I'm like, hard to left? You're not driving the fucking Titanic here, mate. I mean, even that couldn't turn on a dime. But you think you on your piddly little lumbo can go hard to left all of a sudden? <laughs> but thankfully, Forkel misses, and uh, Floki turns with his tail between his legs, like doing the old uh, Monty Python run away, run away, just on a boat instead. <laughs> he looks like we haven't really seen him look afraid before now, but his, like. Yeah. He as as uh, Theowulf points out, like his his gasp and like the expression on his face also <laughs> is incredible. Um, mm. I have to ask you about the shot where he unfurls the scroll from the king. Did oh, you it... already know what my feeling was on that. <laughs> Did it look to you like he was um... holding it like a microphone? <laughs> no, but, but but I'm kinda... right though, Anna. I'm right though. I but thought he kinda, it was just yeah. like. It was like... <laughs> For Kel, for Kel, gotta go to hell. Oh well, oh well. <laughs> That's yeah, Floki's yep. rap song. Yeah, it's Floki <laughs> should find it. He should stick to being a DJ because he can't rap. But uh, well, no, yeah. obviously his debut album would be called Rapper Rock. <laughs> right. So, so when he <laughs> when he like unfurled it, so the expectation of what he was gonna say was set up for me by um. Askeladd and Bjorn talking about uh, well the king and Floki will just, the Yors Vikings will just offer him more money. And that's what I thought he was going to immediately do. He didn't end up doing that till the end of the conversation as he was running in fear. The When he unfurled the parchment and started to read the note was like, surrender you motherfucker or we're gonna kill you and did it look to you like Floki's, like to me like his eyes were a little bit like oh god this is what it says? Oh, shit. I thought we were going to be <laughs> be nice to him. But he was just sort of like, you know, all right, here's the here's the thing. You need to surrender immediately or we will kill you. Oh, no, I can't Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, just, let me just flip this page over. I think I might be reading the wrong one. That was meant for Tim over there. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Ah, here we are. Yes. No, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I like to say, for me, I thought he was about to read out, like, you know, an insult that you'd find on Xbox Live. <laughs> I am an alpha gamer. You are nothing to me. You are just a beta cuck. Uh, we will <laughs> pwn you. Uh, teabag, teabag, teabag. Sign the king. Noob. <laughs> Team killer. <laughs> Team killer. Because <laughs> yes. he technically is. <laughs> He is, yes. This is the StarCraft. Yeah. He for, he didn't read the no BS. He backstabbed. Yeah. So uh, Floki goes back to the king, who continues to both sit ominously in shadows, look like he's incredibly bored, and possibly also be on the toilet all at the once. <laughs> yeah. And so he reaches out, uh, you know, starts stroking the head of this invisible child, and says, kill them all! He's reaching out his hand like that. He did, like, yeah. Like, obvious gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, so, he decides... Uh, you're right, by the way, Andy Lira. Askeladd did indeed make the correct assumption that money would not be the most facing factor for Farkel, as it turns out. So, yeah, the Danish forces decide to row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, and then, you know, take the bridge again. Uh, but this is where Farkel decides that he's going to play an entirely different game with the English. I mean, we firstly had him throwing rocks, but then he decides to invent the game of Battleship. <laughs> B3... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> just put a peg in it right he really oh, did man. I, I, I only noticed that when I rewatched it for the second time sure. 4Kill <laughs> B4Kill is just playing battleships <laughs> I'm not fucking kidding you <laughs> it's true it, no yeah that's amazing uh, I'm actually going to have to edit that in at some point where I'm just going to have to like dub myself over him and say be free <laughs> hit. <laughs> hit it was all hits no misses how did you get so good at Battleship? You're incredible, yeah. Thorkel. Uh, so yeah, Thorkel completely wrecks the fleet. Uh, but this is the point where Thorfinn enters the fray, because he's riding on top of the Mask of Astolad's ship, uh, which drops him off. And then we get, well, round one. Fight. Um, because Thorfinn's going to take on uh, Thorkel, uh, try and take his head. So he can try and take Askeladd's head for what presumably is like the 16th time. Mm-hmm. He's persistent, I'll give him that. You know, he's like the dark side Phil of, you know, uh, Viking warriors. Never succeeds, but he'll keep trying. 
That's a deep cut. Dark side fit. <laughs> yeah. That is a I deep feel cut. Bad for I feel bad for comparing fourth in stat, but it's <laughs> technically should. accurate. <laughs> oh my uh, god. But well, then again, the difference is I like fourth in, so there is that. Yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> so uh, this fight, basically, right? I, I fucking love the technical prowess behind this fight and how it just circled around them in the long, continuous take. It was really, really well done. And it also was very interesting to watch because you basically got the impression that Thorfinn, as good as he is as a fighter, he is a glass cannon. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Thorkel, like, you know, he gets stabbed and he's like, ooh. <laughs> like, Thorkel Thor yeah. Thor is basically the Viking equivalent of that guy from Predator who says, I ain't got time to bleed. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. He's exactly the same. So... The fight goes on, um, and Thorfinn eventually manages to actually get close enough to stab Thorkel straight through the uh, palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. but, well, like I said, Thorkel ain't got time to bleed, nor does he have any shits to give because he couldn't afford any. Spends it all on, you know, bulking up and, you know, playing battleships. The, the so, world's most giant pencil sharpener. <laughs> Sharpen the tree right out of the ground. <laughs> Damn right. He's going to write his name on that bridge when yes, he's done with it. Yes. Oh. So he picks Thorfinn up, and I swear this was like watching when uh, Droopy in the cartoons fights like the uh, guy, like the other wolf guy or whatever. And he just starts throwing <laughs> him around completely out of nowhere. He's, yes. He's, he's beating the crap out of poor Thorfinn, uh, completely oblivious to the pain that he's been dealt. And Askeladd's just like, he's like, oh. Right, let's call it a day, lads. The signal's been called, we'll leave it. Because as, as Askeladd's been wanting to do all this time, he's trying to send Thorfinn on suicide missions, and he knows who Thorkel is and how good he is, so he figures he can probably end. Fair enough. Uh, so yeah, they make, you know, they go, do -loop, do -loop, do -loop, and they're off. Make a break for it. Uh, after that, uh Thorkel picks him up and goes, hey, hey, you know, you're all right. And I'm like, you can tell Thorkel's really strong, but he never really put any of his character creation points into <laughs> intelligence because the last thing I would be doing is handing that kid up while he's still got a death grip on the dagger, like, and another one in his hand. Uh, so he manages to slice off two of Thorkel's fingers, but again, Thorkel don't care. Thorkel's going to Thorkel. He could not give less of a shit. Um, but he respects his willingness to still stand up and fight despite being so thoroughly like battered as he was and he asks for his name and Thorfinn gives him his name and his father's name and as you recall from episode one Thorkel and Thors knew each other um but before Thorkel can like truly talk more about this revelation or like go hey hold up I knew your dad uh Thorfinn makes a break for it and jumps off the bridge uh I want to note to put a pin in that because that'll be important for later as well because obviously he does not kill Thorkel there and then he simply takes his fingers off to loosen his grip. Can That's I important. say... Hmm? Can I just say... Can I just say... It's not often that we talk about anime, especially in this kind of context, like the violence in it, in which I have direct personal experience. But uh -oh. I've had a finger cut off uh, partway. In as you can see, like this is the height that it should be. This is the height that it is. Uh, in a lawn mowing accident. Oh, and let me tell you. Let me tell you. The fact that Thorkel is has that done to two of his fingers and is just standing well, there he's waving through that one. Yeah, like... that too. That too. The the. He's just like, oi, where are you going? Come back, like, call me. Smiling, call me, please. You know, like, are we doing? What are we doing? I don't know, we're just getting started. Accept my friend request on Facebook. <laughs> like, I, I went into shock. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm almost <laughs> passed out from the pain. So, so the fact that he's doing that is fucking incredible. <laughs> I was just like, God damn, this is a man. This is a, this is a more human than human man well put a pin in that thought as well actually but anyway um so four things floating down the stream at this point and the rest of the men say hey should we kill him but uh Falkel's like no leave him 
uh, but we'll do it again sometime, you know. It's like, come back, kid, we'll fight again another day, all that stuff. Uh, we then cut to the Danish army, who, of course, all similarly have, you know, been completely bodied by four kills single-handedly. And they're all in pretty bad shape. Askeladd's like, oh, well, you know, it's all good. We'll set up a supply route. It's fine, fine, fine. No mention of Thorfinn doesn't give two shits about him. Um, we then cut to Ragnar, uh, Floki, um, and I believe the king discussing their next set of plans, which is that London has been too difficult to take. Uh, it's not impossible for them to get it. So they're going to split their differences here, which is to say they're going to leave 4,000 soldiers behind under the leadership of Canute, <clears throat> or Canute, however you pronounce it, uh, who we saw hinted at previously, uh, which Ragnar finds, well, questionable. Like, you oh, know. Man. Yeah, this whole fucking scene is... I'm just so curious about everything. Everything to do with Canute and Ragnar and Floki, too. Because, like, the look that Floki, like, when he turns around and looks at Ragnar... It's just like looking at him in a way that says, you're a scum of the earth. I hate you. I detest everything a... about you. <laughs> yeah, you're a reasonable little shithead who looks like a conehead from Alien Nation, so why don't you fuck right off? <laughs> yeah. Basically. Um. So yeah, that's the plan. 4,000 men, one-fifth of their forces. Um. Canute's going to lead them, even though Canute apparently is not a great leader or warrior from what we've been hinted at thus far, but we will find out in uh, soon enough. So, the soldiers are set off to West Essex, or Wessex, basically. Uh, Thorfinn manages to actually catch up with Askeladd while he's riding on a horse. Uh, Thorfinn's, like, got broken bones and stuff. And Askeladd says, hey, you know what? The wounded get left behind, you know, son. Don't mind me, I'm just going to merrily trot along here. Oh, it's great to be me. I'm Askeladd. How cool am I? Uh, but Thorfinn, you know, clubs his uh, shoulder back in place and keeps on marching with them. Uh, and his base, his comment as he finished, like, what the fuck is the point in war? Why is it so, you know, why people think it's so good? Uh, Beowulf was mentioned in chat, and, I, and as it will undoubtedly be important later, I will mention it here. Anute is also Christian. Yeah. Um, indeed. Uh, that's something that the um, king points out as well. Um, not that the teachers of Christianity have helped in the past in this show with that lady who said, hey, Christianity told me to look after this kid. He's great. Oh, my God, he's burning the village down. Yeah. And I mean... Fucking God, Jesus, man. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack on that. But um, uh, also, the what I think Thorfinn, in those final comments, like, I think he was thinking of Thorkel specifically, right? Like, because he knows... Thorkel like loves I think he got the idea Thorkel loves the battle loves to fight um from their exchange and so yeah as he's walking away I feel like he's saying like thinking about that guy and going like who loves this who in their right mind would love this shit like that guy's fucking nuts <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um but and Indeed, we can, just yeah we can talk about yeah. Canute later but I just want that yeah yeah, indeed. Uh, as the rest of the forces retreat down the river, Falkill, like everyone's like cheering, and Falkill's like, "No, oh, man, that no. was so good." His fucking his bet did not pay off. Like he wanted to, like I don't know if he wants to die, or wants to be put in near death situations, or just wants the battle to go on as long as possible. He wants He's to play battleship. He fucking <laughs> loves that game. He didn't want to win. D12. He yeah. wants to be on the losing side. I mean, uh, I don't know if it's because he wants to die fighting or he wants to just fight for a long time, but like I think I mean, I think I would be inclined to include that he wants to die. Die fighting. Like, that's why he places bet in the losing team, because it's fun to fight. And winning just means you have to sit there and not fight, which he obviously hates. Yeah. I don't think he necessarily wants to die per se, but I think he wants to be challenged. That's the thing I would say. Did you and notice? That... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. On. Oh no, good, good Karen. Did you notice? I've never noticed until now, but I don't know if you have noticed this before. Amazon, <laughs> Helm's Deep, uh, Amazon, on my end has U.S. subs and U.K. subs as a separate option. What? I didn't know well, if that sure. was I, that. I haven't checked. Maybe it's just for this week since um 
You know, I only have English. I don't have any choice. Since you, since we are actually fighting on location in the UK, um, perhaps that's the reason why. But like, uh, I haven't watched the episode twice. I've only watched with the US subs, not with the UK subs. <laughs> and it, I don't know if it's just this week or you know while while you're talking, I'll check and see if there are other ones for other episodes. All right then. Well then, uh, let's start by talking about 4 Kelly. I actually have two points I need to do back to back here. One of them's minor, one of them's major. Um, the first one I want to point out, and I want to give thanks to uh, Feowulf uh, and Blinkaji for firing up a signal flare on this, because I actually went back and looked through the episodes to piece together the puzzle pieces of this. Because it turns out that 4 Kel is the brother of Sigvaldi. Who is Sigvaldi, you might wonder. Sigvaldi is the leader of the Yom's Vikings. Why is that relevant? Because you might recall that when Fors is giving his flashback to uh, Ari, uh, you know, with him seeing Ilva for the first time once she was born, he mentions Helga, his wife, partner, whatever you want to call it, was the daughter of the leader. So put, connect together that family tree and you will realize that for Kel, Orphan's granduncle. Uncle Canute. Or no, wait. Uh, Thorkel, you say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because wow. he's the brother of Sigvaldi. Sigvaldi is the father of uh, Helga. Okay. Where did we learn that? We had to piece it together. Okay. So I actually went back and checked the episodes. Because as I mentioned, um, the, our patrons, uh, Feo, uh, Feo Wolf and Blinkaj, were talking about this. So I decided to go back and actually look through it. I could be mm -hmm. wrong, by the way. So if they want to pipe in and say that I am talking out my ass here, then please do so. Uh, however, um, he mentioned in this episode, it's mentioned that Farkel is the brother of Sigvaldi. So I went back and had a look. Who is Sigvaldi? He is the leader of the Yom's Vikings. Okay? So in episode three, when Ari, you know, is on the boat saying, tell me a war story, and instead Fors says, oh yeah, this is when my daughter was born. Fors mentions in part of that flashback that he partnered up with Helga, who was the daughter of the leader of the, Vi the Yom's Vikings, because he was part mm -hmm. of that group. That's it. Okay. Yep. So Farkel is Thorfinn's granduncle. Well, fuck me. <laughs> now, I actually have to make a confession here. I had to piece together some of that information by looking up the Wikipedia entry for Falkel, because he's actually a literal historical figure, turns out, although more lost to legend and myth, as it turns out, um, and adapted for the purposes of the anime. Well, we've already established uh, that he had a Nickelodeon show that would air in the evenings, <laughs> and it was a comedy about people that worked at a store and a fast food restaurant. And, mm. uh, you know, well, he's a historical figure. We know this. Indeed. So, okay, let's have a think about lots of stuff that we've seen in this anime so far about characters being very larger than life and capable of incredible combat prowess and like feats. I mean, this episode is full of them. We've got Falkel playing battleships. We've got him throwing rocks. We've got him taking a stab through the hand and ignoring it. Now... The funny thing is, when I was reading Farkel's entry on Wikipedia, as in the actual figure and not, you know, the character from the show, there was a lot of discussion about him being described as being an incredible fighter, but kind of one who's, you know, described almost as myth. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that that be might be the idea behind why he's presented as such in Vinland Saga. Because if I'm being quite blunt, as much as the king might say that Farkel could hold off the army himself, in reality, that's probably not true. But a lot of Viking legend, or rather Viking history, is part myth and part, um, you know, part truth. There's a little bit of that mix in there. So I think that his betrayal here is meant to follow that kind of tradition of being a large and live character and not some being there for anime purposes. Similarly with Thor's. Thor's is like legendary prowess on the battlefield. is also following that kind of similar vein of half truth, half myth. And also why Thorfinn can live for as long as he's done so far. That's why I think that this show has now actually made itself clear on how it portrays these characters as being larger than life and capable of these incredible feats, such as even, say, you know, Asclad's running of the boats. Because that's a, you know, yeah, that was awesome. part of myth. Mm -hmm. Part of myth and history that is sometimes embellished a little to make things seem more courageous and heroic. It so really the does. real Farkel... Yeah. yeah, that's a The really... real Farkel... Sorry, do you want to... No, I'm I'm so sorry. I was just I was only going to underscore your point and be like that's such a cool point like that. Yeah. But that's why I reckon the real Farkel, the one who actually lived, he probably was nowhere near as big or as strong as presented in this show or even in any other written uh text from the time. 
there are probably more folklore and stories and such, you know. Indeed, I think that part of his presentation is how perhaps the English might have viewed him as well. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But certainly some of the events do match up, because I do believe he did fight for them, from what I remember from the Wikipedia article, um, including certain events that followed that may potentially have spoiled events of the show, but, well, SOL on that one. Shit out of luck. So, yeah, I find that really fascinating that the show yeah. is continuing on with that trend. And it's actually allowing this kind... It's funny how, like, when you see Farkel, like, throw, like, the rocket, because there's, like, his, his buster attack or something like that, which <laughs> sounds like something straight out of fucking, I don't know, Symphagear or some shit like that. But it's funny how it allows it to get away with the more anime or manga, like, ex, uh, how should we call it, you know, like, extravagancies, like, you know, where mm-hmm. uh, things are quite out there because it ties into the idea of these people being not just necessarily men, but also mythological characters, even legends. It, yeah, I mean, it's such a fucking good point. Like, I hadn't uh, put two and two together, but you know so much of what i enjoy or or what i've been exposed to i guess i I might enjoy straight up just regular old viking history but like the mythology from that area it's like so great and uh the fact that it feels like that is Hmm. maybe kind of an access point for some people with the show and yeah like i mean the way that thor's the troll died with like a bazillion arrows in him like you said carrying the boat Thorkel throwing trees um and maybe Thorfinn will get to do something incredible uh later on that sort of exceeds the bounds of human possibility um well I'd say he already has did you see what he did with leaping that distance over to the fort climbing up it to assassinate the commander after murdering how many soldiers in front of him that already is an incredible feat that's true that's true I guess I mean um that it'll be the centerpiece of his of his story. Uh, mm-hmm. it, you know what I mean? He'll maybe have like a like a flipping off the tree trunk, like a like a myth. Um, that it'll be like every. It, it seems like he's been a a sort of character in the myth of Asgard and the myth of Thorkell, but uh, perhaps he'll have his own uh, really larger than life moment in a myth that is about him hmm. is maybe what i'm Absolutely. um all right we will see we over will to see. you doc okay so um i want to say that i think that it is really important that thorfinn lost this battle um i think you only have to cast your mind back to like banana fish right to think about like the effect that a main character continuing to surmount insurmountable odds uh, can have on your enjoyment of a show, your uh, liking of the main character. Now, this is me saying that about Banana Fish, a show that I still adore and think is tremendous work. Mm. Still love it. But some weeks it got a little much in that department. Like Ash was just superhuman all the time. People couldn't fucking hit him. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, and Thorfinn hasn't been even up to this point, despite the fact that he's uh, come out on top of all his encounters. He's never really seemed like that. Well, I guess he's continued to lose to Askeladd, but that feels different. That feels like the plot going no. You know what I mean? Um, we will delay you for now. But the fact that he lost this fight to Sorkel, like, it was set up just like a couple of other different scenarios we've seen, and we've seen him succeed. And I know I thought, well, the odds look tiny. He's clearly outmatched, but he'll find a way to beat this guy because he's always found a way to, to do whatever Askeladd asks him to do. But he didn't. And I thought it was great. And it shows, like, despite what we just said about this being um, feeling like a myth, that it feels like a story about, like, a person um, mm. with weaknesses, with uh, um, who, who, even though he, like, he didn't even lose this fight because of some sort of flaw in his ability or his character. He just got outclassed. Um, well, he made... The... He made... He made the mistake a lot of fine game players make is that he spent too long getting close to the grappler. 
I mean, you got to stay away from. I've done. I've done that myself many times. Yep. Played a fair few Potemkins, get too close, you get Potemkin busted, and you die. And in this case, he just got command thrown until he lost all his health. It was. Whoops. I mean, let's play Farfin. <laughs> fuck's sake, <laughs> Thorfin. Training mode. Thorfin, don't throw your joystick into the tail. Thorfin, get back here. Thorfin, you can't just quit. You can't just quit. He technically did rage quit. <laughs> he did. He just jumped off the bridge and left. Um, yeah, like I, I don't know. I to me, it feels like, uh, and this is gonna sound. Uh, this may put people off or whatever, but like it's a reference that it, it's an analogy that makes sense to me. It felt like really solid pro wrestling booking. Like when you want to, when you have someone who you see a lot of potential in, you want to make them a future star. Uh, it's important that they win, right? But it's also important that they are put in situations, eventually, once they've established themselves, uh, like a step up the ladder to being on top of the mountain, so to speak, uh, is having good losses. And yeah. they make you care about the person when they 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 come up against these really long odds they get put in the situation that they lose but they look great doing it but clearly they're not ready to be on that level yet and i feel like yeah. this is it's about this keeping it grounded mm -hmm. yeah and this is this is what happened and i thought it's really really great and important and um i don't know you know i, I think it's easy it's an easy comparison to reach out to Berserk, right? And when we talk about this show, because they feel sort of similar in some ways. Um, like when uh, Griffin, uh, Griffin defeats Guts for the first time? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if if Guts had a moment like that. And I guess it would be, I guess it would be that where he loses to, to Griffith. Um, although I don't know, I don't know if this loss will prove to be quite as significant, but, um, but yeah. I, I just think that this was so important in keeping him grounded, keeping him likable, shaking up the show's formula, not making things feel rote, helping us appreciate and enjoy Thorkel. You know, because if he just died in this one episode, like, we don't get more Thorkel. But Thorkel is built up because he beat Thorfinn. Thorfinn's great, mm -hmm. but he beat him. And now like, we get to see more of him and, and him do more crazy shit. So I think this Indeed. was, like, such a great... Uh, move on the author's part. Yeah, I agree. All right, so I'm going to actually segue from that onto the point about, um, again, just as a re reinforcement here of Thorfinn not necessarily killing because he wants to, but because he wants to see it serve the point of getting him to, you know, being able to fight Askeladd in that duel. Again, we have more evidence in this episode that he could in theory kill Askeladd pretty much any time he wanted to. If you aim just a little bit to the right, Askeladd wasn't even paying attention. No, nope. could have got him right clean in the forehead. Mm -hmm. So I went back. So think about it, right? Forkel says out loud, oh, look, they've left you. They've abandoned you. That's it. Game over. But Thorfinn wasn't, you know, out cold. He wasn't unconscious. He wasn't dead. And Forkel um, had no idea. So there's nothing really stopping, I would say, Thorfinn from stabbing him straight in the jugular while he wasn't paying attention. He could have had it. The opportunity was there. You know, the, despite the fact that you know Forkel is like eight, you know, eight feet tall and weighs five hundred pounds of solid muscle, you know, he's built like a brick shit house. Could have still killed him, but he didn't. He only took up his fingers to allow him to get his grip off the dagger, so that way he could then actually, you know, and his and his arm, for, his hand for that man, mm -hmm. so he could escape. That was it. And I think that's the key thing to remember that although Forfin has, you know, killed many people throughout his time and will undoubtedly continue to murder, you know, stab, slice and dice, backstab, ambush, etc., etc., uh, he doesn't do it unnecessarily in his own mind. It will seem unnecessary <clears throat> to us, of course, because in our minds as the audience, we should think to ourselves, well, you know, revenge is stupid. Why the fuck are you doing this? You know, your life is spent. You are a clockwork creature, as I've said of other characters in the past, motivated by one thing that once you actually have it and you've seized it and tasted it, you will be nothing at that point. Like I said, Hunters are nothing about the hunt. So he still hangs on to some threads of morality in the context he's provided with. But, you know, uh, he unfortunately does not get the chance to take, you know, kill Askeladd. I mean, I mean, he might have seen in his head, you know, oh, Askeladd's abandoned me and I have no guarantee I'll see him again. So if I did cut off this guy's head and just carry it with me, I'll just, you know, 
it's the size of a fucking, you know, watermelon. That's not an easy thing for one to carry, and it'll rot and all that. You, all these, all these things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he doesn't do it just because he can. He's killing for a purpose, his very specific purpose, which is stupid and infantile. Don't get me wrong. But it's just a reminder of that, which I thought was neat. Yeah. Also, because we don't want you know uh, four Celts to go yet, because he's too cool. <laughs> he is. He's super cool. Um. Okay. Yeah. No, that was. I agree. Agreed on all points. Um. Uh, let's see. So we've answered a couple of the questions I had. Oh. Uh. So. Um. A minor point before uh, I get into another big one, which I think you might get into next. So I'll let you, if you do. Um, minor point, uh, I thought, I, I don't know who to credit with this, um, but some of the facial expressions in this episode were so good and so <laughs> detailed Um that I, I guess this is the way they looked in the manga, but like we already talked about Floki um, and his uh, looks of fear. But Thorfinn at the end of the episode, like after, you know, he has that talk with Askeladd and he pops his shoulder back into place, he looks humiliated. Absolute, like just totally uh humiliated like he he had, his heart had just been smushed by a heel and ground down mm. he looked fucking destroyed and he looked angry he was like he looked like he's about to cry like the look it just communicated so much both when you couldn't see his eyes when the hair was down and you could see at the bottom of his face and the way his mouth was twisted and uh and then when the camera went kind of under him and you could see up into his face when he was uh, kind of decrying war as this fun enterprise, like all that, like there were several, and and the king, even though we don't get to see his eyes, we see a lot of his face. Like they're so good, they are really really good. And like <laughs> the fact that this is Studio Wit, um, I really do think, like I mean, the, a lot of these faces remind me of Attack on Titan expressions, like the sort of more grotesque expressions on the faces of the titans they bring in those elements and don't make it look silly like they use them in a way to like highlight the um, emotional state of the characters in a way that like just really brings it home and it was mm. so good this episode i loved it <laughs> well that that plays into what i said before about Falkel being large in life because he's got those goofy expressions mm -hmm. but again that exaggeration is part of the you know half myth half truth element to picture of characters like him in history particularly you know martial history like of the times of like hand-to-hand -hand combat mm -hmm. um, you know and melee combat like here so yeah i agree with you whole highly the, the the show has the show's flaws in my opinion animation wise are always with backgrounds mm. uh, when there's the guy chopping down the uh i'll try and chop down one of the struts on the bridge when we get the longest shot of the boat and he's on the left hand side uh his axe does not look like he's actually making contact with anything <laughs> It's just they're like missing by a, like half an inch. Don't ruin so, the magic, Shadon. <laughs> that's why I do on these podcasts. Oh, God's <laughs> sake! I always ruin it's the magic. True, you, you do. Know this. Yep. Professional party I always, pooper. I always piss on everyone's you know cornflakes. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> but that sh the right. shadow too, and I didn't mention. You, do you remember when Thorkel? Like your first, were introduced to him in the beginning, and you're like, okay. You know, he's like, mm -hmm. ah, like the flow of the world. He's just kind of talking. And you're like, oh, this guy, like he's. God damn he's gone quiet. Mm -hmm. I know I did that on purpose because the the fucking motion sensitive lights kicked in and really <laughs> fucked up my my mojo. Anyway, was that, was that your was that your flash dance moment? I don't were you know. Sign, were you going to dance with dance numbers? Is that why the lights went off? I've never seen flash dance. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I'll just say yes. I'll yes. Yeah, just, yep, just go. That just, was go it. Yeah. Um, just go with yes. But like, you you see Thorkel, right? And we don't really know how mad he is in the beginning, except as soon as he starts to tell Floki, like he leans into the camera you know, over the side of the bridge, you know, and he's like, actually, I want to be on the losing side and like the way the shadows play across his face as he starts to smile it just tells you like 
okay, there's a little bit of darkness in this guy. Like I like all oh, these little touches on the, the with the facial expressions were so yeah. good. Well, if you well if you think about it as well, like if you go back to the very first episode, like it's been at least for Finn's lifetime, if not a little bit longer, since we last saw Forkel in that battle at the ocean with Fors. Fors got out, Forkel didn't. No. And by the show's own thesis that's gone on so far about that war is hell and wasteful and stupid and pathetic, by all accounts, we should see what Forkel's doing as a tragedy. But he's also mm. awesome, mm -hmm. which kind of sort of ties back into what I said about Asgard and the boats previously. Although in this case, I'm not so worried about that because Forkel is clearly not meant to be presented more as a, uh, you know, as a villain because he's obviously not personally absolutely massively wronged Forfin. Uh, he's more ambiguous. You're more. It's more easy to like him as a character, and therefore get on board with him playing battleships. You know, I'm glad you brought this. <laughs> no, it's such a good that. reference. Uh, I'm glad you brought this up because this is actually a really good point. Because um, I have, in the early parts of this show, said that Gundam 0080 War in the Pocket was a good recommend for if you enjoyed the tone of the early episodes of the show, and I'll stand by that. Um, but what you're saying now about Askeladd in the boat running across the, the hillside uh, and Thorkel, you know, makes me wonder, like, it, this show might have its own kind of version of the Gundam problem. And what that is, for, for folks out there who haven't seen a Mobile Suit Gundam show, is that... Uh... <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. You, so the, the message of... Uh, most Gundam shows, in fact, I believe all Gundam shows, is in fact that war is hell, and it is It's the Edwin bad. Star. Mm. What? Ed Edwin Star. War! Good God! Yo. Right, yeah, totally. So that's You're supposed uh, to follow what is it good for? What oh. is it? Well, I'm sorry. Shadon, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it <laughs> again! Um, yes. <laughs> it is the Edwin Star problem. Uh, or, or, or it, that's that's the line it takes, right? Officially, that's the line. But also, but the problem is, as you say, though, there's cool giant robots, robots in and... this show doing cool things. And if it's peacetime, we don't get to see the cool robots, and we have yeah. to keep having more shows to keep selling us toys of these combat machines. Exactly. I mean, what I said with Asgard in the previous episode was my complaint was very specifically about us and him individually our the audience Askeladd relationship you want to call it that because the episode was out of order relative to how it was in the mm -hmm. manga if it was at the beginning it wouldn't be a problem anyway I'm not going to retread that ground with 4K the issue is not so much with 4K as you say there but it's more the wider context like the show wants us to think the war is shit and awful and indeed the opening frames of this episode are oh there's a dude floating in the river with an arrow on his back and then we get the scenes later on of all of the um Danish people, you know, mm -hmm. soldiers like mutilated, blind, you know, co op, whatever. But Farkel's playing battleships, and it's funny and it's great, <laughs> and it's entertaining. You love that shit. Yeah. But then again, he's not necessarily killing people by cutting them with swords. But then again, he did kill people with an axe in the previous episode, so what the fuck do I know? Um, but yeah, you're right. It is the uh, Gundam problem, which is war's bad, but. Cool, somehow. Whether it be robot or godly warrior. Yeah, very, oh, that's, I hadn't thought about this show in those terms quite yet, but uh, that's interesting. I wonder if 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 you all think that that is the case, uh, especially people that have read the manga. I'd, I'd be curious to hear from you. Hmm, absolutely. All right, so quick point from me, this is only a brief one, but just to point out again that much like how Forfin kind of has his own dual nature of holding on to his honor or what he senses as honor, uh, and that's the way he, you know, dictates his revenge, and that's how the framework upon which he executes it, rather than just simply killing Asgard in his sleep or pushing him off the boat over a deep sea or whatever. Um, it, in Bjorn's case, he mentions that uh, Falkel is a traitor, but not to, you know, uh, well, for Bjorn, like, you know, he grows his mushrooms in glass houses, so sometimes when he takes pot shots, he throws stones from them, because... You know, he himself is a pirate. He will murder and kill, be indeed, because he says so. He's not in for the money, he just wants to murder and kill. So what we see here is that classic case of, you know, um, well, it's a bad thing, but not unless I'm doing it. 
But it's still that kind of contradiction where he wants to hold on to a kind of sense of honor and like, you know, formality to his murder. But also, you know, in which it kind of makes him look a hypocrite. Um, so it's noteworthy there that, again, that follows the trend of the show. Characters are caught in a tension between two things. Falls at the very beginning, his old life versus the new. Thorfinn versus, you know, his honor and need, to, you know, to, and his desire to kill Askeladd versus the reality you can just do it any time. Or even, as we'll undoubtedly see later on, his perhaps willingness to leave that behind in favor of, you know, going to Vinland, living out his time there. Bjorn's own thing of like, you know, I'm a mass murderer, but I do have a sense of loyalty to my country, damn it. And, you know, so that continues to be a strong uh, continuing theme throughout the show, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only what I really want to say on that particular point. Do you have another doc? Yeah, I wanted us to talk about Canute. Or I keep wanting to say Canute, but clearly they're just, just let's saying just, Canute. Let's just call him Canute. That's, that's what they're, I think that's what they're, they're saying, they're pronouncing. But, uh, man, what a mysterious, interesting guy. Like, I, does Canute have any relation to Sigvaldi or Thorfinn or anything uh, like that? I didn't read that up. I okay. was only interested in Falkel specifically because of that point. Okay. Well, um, don't spoil it for me though, if it hasn't been. I I, I don't thus far I don't people. know any. I know nothing. Yeah, I know nothing. Because um, I uh, that wasn't my main the main thrust of my point. Although he does, you know, the long blonde hair and you know, pull off the mask. I'm I'm sure he's gonna look like a blonde haired blue eyed Viking guy, which could mean that he's part of the Thor's family. But um. But no, I, I think like the whole thing about um, the king telling um, Ragnar, uh, well, maybe the reason that he's so faint of heart uh, and kind of soft, right, and not a warrior because you spoiled him and because of the teachings of Christ, uh, which I, I think are, are super interesting. Like, I would love any historian that was listening to this i know we have at least one that has been listening <laughs> on soundcloud uh please like how the, the vikings acceptance of christianity into their into their countries like how did that go kind of did it clash with uh the ways of war how uh how fictionalized is all this was this even a thing um well we know how Ascalad thinks about uh, you know christian monks Let's yeah, use yeah. a target practice. Yeah, <laughs> and and the king is clearly not very fond. Uh, yeah, I mean the the I mean the um, teachings of Christ certainly are quite upside down from what uh, Odin and Loki and the Norse gods are getting up to, uh, and kind of mm -hmm. what is seen as virtuous and uh, you know death and battle and all that. Um, like it, it's a totally different thing and uh yeah if he's not been raised with this idea that like combat like valor on the battlefield is something to be like prized above almost anything else but rather like humility uh you know love thy neighbor um turn the other cheek mercy grace all those kind of things as virtues rather than the other like oh, he's gonna be mm -hmm. really different so it could go that way. He could be what is des being described by the king. But, mm. but... He's going to get the army to run up to the English holding up signs saying free hooks. <laughs> They're all going to go out passing. They're going to like disguise themselves as English and infiltrate London and pass out pamphlets. Are you saved? When's, have you been to church? You know, what, mm -hmm. Do you know the fate of your eternal soul? You know, <laughs> like, uh, here's a pamphlet. Follow the Roman road to salvation. <laughs> uh but like i i actually am wondering like and again like i'm i'm gonna think about berserk here remember how, how the <laughs> remember how the christians were in berserk like uh oh boy uh i can't even i'm bad at the character names but the the sort of square-faced monk guy and um mosgul 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 mongol uh and the lady farnese um they oh god yeah especially the the monk fellow were particularly cruel and i wonder if 
the scenario is actually Ragnar has been protecting people from Canute, and Canute is this like twisted, cruel, like I'm gonna kill you for Jesus kind of. You know what I mean? Like I must purify well, the world of the sinners. There's your berserk allegory. Yeah, I'm gonna kill kill all the sinners, kind of like, and, and just be incredibly. Uh, um, not even sociopathic because like I mean it would seem like that to us but he clearly would believe he's doing the right and good thing but like yeah just just cruel I think is the best word I can have for it and man I hope I hope that that's the case because those kind of characters I find really fascinating yeah. despite how twisted just, they are just, just see it now Canute just goes up to the local and just says alright which do you prefer Old Testament or New Testament and they all say their own thing and he goes well I know I prefer Old Testament, because that's how I roll, baby. Kill a lot of them. Yes, exactly. Or you just yeah. like torturing, like oh man, like just I could see it. I could, re- and Ragnar just be like, no, 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 Canute. Like remember, love, love. We gotta, we can't let the king find out that you're this fucked up son of a bitch. <laughs> like, um, but but yeah, I uh, I'm so excited about what he could, and, and if it does turn out that he's a very kind of warm and loving person. That could also add a new wrinkle and dimension to the story. So I'm really excited to see what this character brings. Indeed. All right. Okay, I've got one final point to make, and this is not actually specific to this episode, but since if I might be so honest, there's not a huge amount to talk about thematically with this episode beyond the minor points we kind of brought up here and there and the wider mythological element. Because this is more, I think, one of those episodes where it's clear is, I suppose, that it came from a manga, because it feels like a one-shot thing more than anything that doesn't that has more time allowed between it, like depending on the release schedule. I'm not entirely sure of Vinland size, we said, but it seems most apparent to me is this kind of a one-shot thing that's mostly just there for fun and entertainment, with a little bit here and there, you know, to reinforce the existing. But the status quo doesn't really change. It's another case of you know. Well, Forth is basically having the same problem as Reese Repulse from the Power Rangers. Going to keep trying for that same goal. <laughs> can't, can't get it. Or, you know, Shredder and Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We've got to get the Technodrome out from the Earth. Oh, we don't <laughs> fucking do it this time, do we? Back to the beginning. The status quo doesn't really change. So let's talk about something a bit wider here. Let's talk about comparing Vinland Saga to other anime that we've talked about in the past. And I'm going to mention two specifically here. They're not Berserk, by the way. Mm. Just preemption. The first one is, of course, Banana Fish. And the second one is a show that you and I did not talk about on the podcast, but we have talked about elsewhere, 91 Days. Okay, okay. All right, so what are the common Tell elements me. of all three of these shows? We have male protagonists, usually around teenage years, who've had their lives utterly destroyed by the murder of their father. And they are all beset on, well, not even, sorry, in, I've realized now, even though we talked about it for 26 episodes, that actually doesn't really apply to Ash. But in that Ash's case, I would argue it more applies to his best friend, Shaw. So the murder of a loved one, then. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they embark on a quest for revenge and ultimately to free themselves from the uh, torched existence that they end up in. However, that's the starting point and the impetus that they all commonly share with certain degrees of differences on context. But each of these three shows has different theses and different, like, declarative statements as part of their texts on the outcome of that and what is the saving grace, if any of them. Now, Banana Fishes was the love of another person, in this case, AJ. Now, you might say, well, Ash died at the end. How does that work? And for me, as we discussed previously, and I know that this is just my opinion and you're free to disagree because it is quite controversial, I get that. For me, it was the belief and knowing that there would be someone waiting for you. That was true for both. AJ went back to Japan, and, you know, he always knew that Ash would be out there waiting for him. And in turn, Ash presumably passed away in the library with the comfort knowing that AJ was safe and out there, and they would, you know, if you're a spiritual person, meet up later at a certain point, you know, in the pearly gates, however you want to describe it. Right. That was his eman- final emancipation now as his freedom. 91 days, nope, no one escapes. Crime is all-consuming, it will devour you, it will devour your soul, it will leave your soulless husk, and it will lead you to the point where you could literally kill the man who murdered your father, you will have the opportunity to beat you like, I don't give two fucks, I'm gonna let you live, because you've gotta now do a shitload of firefighting to even begin to rebuild your empire, and he dies. So, let's come back to Vinland Saga. What is its thesis statement? At this point in the show, it's not 
clear, if I'm quite honest, because as much as it has been about the idea of Vinland, indeed, the slave that we saw earlier, the discussion with a lady whose name is a country whose name I don't remember, because as I said, I felt like she was a one-shot character, and she's not important. Oh, uh, the, the... Oh, my the gosh. Serving. Yeah, who I know is going to come back and be the saving grace of, of Thorfinn. M NPC number 134. Oh, boy, why can I not remember her name? I'm going to look it up. Hordaland. There we go. Hordaland. Ah, uh, yes, now. that's right. Horsland is what it sounded like they were oh. saying. <laughs> it did Man. sound like that. That's what it sounded like on the the audio. Listen to the Japanese track. Promise. <laughs> Seriously, you need to stop watching the Pornhub dub of this, or the Porn dub, I suppose. <laughs> oh, the porn, the porn dub. That's good. Is that yes. gonna? That's gonna be at Porn dub's new. Oh, sorry, Porn <laughs> new streaming service for anime. It's just gonna be hentai, and it's gonna be called Porn dub. Oh fuck! Get on it. That's a million dollar idea. I'd rather not. <laughs> I'm having that appear on my bank statement each fucking month. Jesus Christ, people can ask Shell questions. Shell companies, Shadon, Shell companies. Have it be, you know, uh, Blue Towers Media. That's that's all you got to do. That's it. No, not with a name like that. <laughs> How about... Okay, hell. All right, all right moving, moving away from things that I hope will not be. Throbbing Member, LLC. <laughs> no one will deduce what you're actually selling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, dedu I'm deducing what you're selling right now, and I ain't fucking buying, lad. All right, so let's move away from things that will probably happen, and, well, that'll be my nightmares then. But anyway, <clears throat> so Finland Saga's thesis. It's actually about environment, I would argue. The promise of, like, you know, an escape to a different location, a different place in time and in the world, which is divorced from, you know, the land that you came from, which I think it's arguing maybe can't be saved. You know, Vinland is this place of freedom, it's fertile, there's always sunshine, all that. And regardless of where we've been thus far in the show's reality, apart from Leaf's own flashbacks, we've had violence, or, you know, when even Fors tried to escape the violence of, you know, his past, he ended up exiling himself to a frozen wasteland. So, I always find it interesting, like, the more and more shows we watch that have this basic formula, that they all have different messages on what the get-out is. What the, you know... The escape uh, plan is from vengeance and, you know, the destruction of one's soul. 91 days doesn't happen. And I'm okay with it because that was explicitly meant as a tragedy throughout. Mm -hmm. No yeah. one really survived or got out of that. Prime, you know, was an infectious, like, you know, parasite that just devoured generation after generation. It spread through, you know, throughout the family and the children. Even people who were completely otherwise involved in the actual activity were still tainted by it. Uh, for banana fish... It was, say, one of a person. That special person who, you know, has an instance that you don't have, or maybe even a world weariness or experience that you don't have. You know, complementary people. You know, two people making each other whole. The Vinland is environment. It's the promise of a better place, free from the life that you've come from now, where either the land itself is dead or dying, or there are people dead or dying in it, um, that you may not be able to fix or change, but why not go elsewhere? Then? So I'm going to say, I think we had a little bit of this discussion earlier that I think that the first episodes of the show in particular lay the groundwork for Vinland being, um, I don't want to say not a real place because obviously Canada exists. Um, but this the idea of Vinland as... That's it, the escape, idea, yeah. Uh, you know, the idealized version of it doesn't exist, but like, maybe like you sort of have to transcend, you know, slavery, like your, your kind of slavery to, and, and, you know, as Glad has said, it's not just like literal slavery, but every person is a slave to something, but it's going to be about transcending that deterministic kind of mechanistic uh uh world that uh, of master and slave and kind of this it may sound corny but like your heart finding its own vinland right um that's what i think it will it will be yep you're um, right and i have the opinion that fourth so. will end up actually going to vinland in the 
No, do you, I think, do, do, you, do you think it'll be like a dilapidated wasteland? And he'll just be like, no, the dreams and promises. And then Hordaland will be like, honey, Finland is in your heart. And then that'll be it. That'll be it. Roll Finland friends. is where you lay your head. <laughs> That's where Finland was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Sorry, it had to be said. Oh, oh God. <laughs> the yeah. real Finland. But yeah, like, I, I'm finding it like that there's a lot of these stories now that we've covered. And it might be worth, like, you know, once we've built more of these up, having a wider discussion of them because it seems to be a common thing. I, I mean, love that I've been recently, I've been reading recently that um, a book by Haruki Murakami about the, this is tangential, but I promise it will lead somewhere, mm-hmm. um, about the 1995 sarin gas attacks. Um, this is relevant because I've been recently watching Maro Penguin Drum and I've been wanting to get some context behind that show because it's vitally important you know about those attacks in more detail in order to truly understand the show's you know details and its characters and their motivations and even its imagery. Anyway, we're not talking about Maro Penguin Drum. This is Finland. Why is this related to England? In my because I think that in the wake of uh, the Siren attacks, like there've been a lot of stories about like you know Japan's destruction or decimation, and then people coming around after that fact. Um, not saying necessarily that they're all completely the results of that, but I think that Japan in general, and I again could be completely shining out my ass here, like I think that culturally they seem to have a very strong response in their fiction through events that have happened to them. And I'm curious if, you know, like as we go along, maybe we can try and put together why there are so many stories like this of damaged, vengeful people of that age, bear in mind they are all teenagers, which mm-hmm. I feel is not something that is a, co- a coincidence, um, trying to find a new place to be. Uh, you know, trying to, you know, recover from themselves, you know, from their loss. Yeah. Um, it's just to me seems interesting. It's a common thread that's explored a lot. I mean, Vinland Saga was written in 2005, as I remember. Hmm. But I fish earlier than that, 91 days. I think that was an original work that was much more recent. I could be wrong on that. But it still continues to be a common trend, I think, in a lot of storytelling in Japanese anime. It's a good story, don't get me wrong. Like, the, this... This is, I'm not complaining that Vinland Saga is derivative or repetitive because it simply features these tropes. Tropes and cliches in themselves are not inherently bad. It is your execution thereof that is key. And Vinland Saga thus far has been pretty much across the board in executing it well. Flubs here and there. So that's why I'm always happy to keep hearing this. And plus, as I say, it has a substantial difference in not so much its impetus, but its outcome. Mm-hmm. I love this. I think this is a great point, especially seeing... Uh, seeing the similarity in origin of these protagonists, right? Being mm-hmm. having their fathers uh, taken away oh, in one, particular, yeah. or yeah. loved one. But I mean, what happened to Ash's parents? They were both. I mean, he didn't really have a dad. Well, the, I'm I'm still of the opinion the the thing that set him off was short as death. Mm-hmm. That was the yeah. moment he was like, "No, I'm going to fucking murder my way through you, and I'm going to." Yo, Golzine, I'm going to take you out. I'll put it on a pike and then shoot it into a fucking toxic waste dump. Yes, there was no way back after that for Golzine. I um, mean, you saw what he did. You remember what he did in that laboratory when he found that scientist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the bro- his brother had already died at that point, right? <laughs> yes, it was emphatic. Um, I think the brother had already died. Um. And I, I, maybe the same would hold true with the brother. Uh, but, like, being cut off from the father, I think, I, I'm just shooting from the hip, like, it seems like, a, apart from kind of the the uh, obvious tragic nature of losing your father, um, one kind of level up symbolically, perhaps that is about um, being cut off from the traditions that you're meant to inherit like through the patriarch of the family um through uh the, those the kind of old ways the traditional ways uh being cut off from inheriting that before you get a chance to because of some disruption and mm, maybe it's indeed. like people feeling people feeling lost and separated from kind of the meaning that those old traditions gave to the lives mm-hmm. of those that followed them and the way they mm-hmm. shaped shaped their world. Um, mm-hmm. These young men don't have that. Um, so, oh boy, you know. I, 
I've been discussing this elsewhere. There's a lot to, there's a, believe me, there's a lot to be discussed about the idea of, you know, finding a narrative for yourself and a meaning in your life, mm. you know, because there's something absent. And unfortunately, that relates to a lot of wider topics on the internet and people like groups. It's beyond the scope of this podcast. We're just talking about Far Kel playing Battleship. But it, I feel like that we probably, once we've covered much more material beyond Vinland Saga that has this same idea, then maybe it might be worth taking a wider look at the cultural reasons why these stories keep coming back in Japanese anime. Again, I'm totally down for that because I think they're all fascinating, and Vinland Saga is something very good. If I had one thing that I'm going to say now, though, to offer as a complaint, and this is the point where people can turn off the stream if they wish, because I'm going to start griping. I am of the opinion that as entertaining as this episode was to watch, even despite the, you know, War is Help Gundam problem, it feels like the show has already dealt a lot of its cards in terms of its deep, more deeper philosophical discussions. Because to me, it feels like Force's story until he died was the more complicated, you know, introspective one of a man trying to escape, similarly as, for, as Forfin's now trying to do, from his past. Uh, and the fact that Forfin, you know, like, the status quo is set in this episode. Like, you can talk about the wider, like, you know, war effort and what happens with Canute and, like, the 4,000 soldiers. But really, that's window dressing. What's truly important in this story is the character stuff. And there is no change. Forfin starts and ends this episode in the same place as he begins. Um, so to me, I am still enjoying the show, don't get me wrong. But I feel like it's had a really, really strong start. But now it's starting to run a little bit out of gas. And I would like it to build back up to that which i'm no doubt it will don't get me wrong but i'm just offering this as a preface for my rating of the episode because it is going to be lower than the other ratings i've given before but i rate more and more like on the you know even if i give it a low one it can still be quite good but it's more relative to the other episodes in this season swine uh, <laughs> I am I am the rich of this podcast come on i'm the i'm you know the destroyer of all happiness i'm the anadonic prick here Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a word for it. Incapable of experiencing joy, motherfuckers. So, uh, that reminds me that Anod Anodyne 2 needs to hurry up and come out for the PlayStation 4, because <laughs> I want to play it. Uh, it's been on PC for a minute. Um, Indeed. Uh, so, I I think I, I do agree with you. Like, thematically, we don't get to cover any new ground here. I, I don't think that that's, like... Um, an unpardonable sin uh for a mm. long show especially uh, oh no 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 you know we get uh we get our entertainment um we get a new character uh we get to kind of see him play around a little bit we get uh some new a little bit of the new thir uh, thir from blah, 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 blah. new thor keenan yep thor keenan we get new uh, circumstances in a way for Thorfinn because he loses and has to come back hanging his head, um, which we've not seen before. But this is all, again, this is all plot stuff. This isn't all really new kind of thematic stuff. Um, it is yeah. more plotty, but, you know, but... Um, I mean, the, the plot really that we care about, the micro one, I mean, there's a macro plot of the war, but the micro plot we care about is Thorfinn wants to murder the ever-loving shit out of Askeladd. Mm -hmm. Does he progress any step towards making that happen in this episode? No. If anything, he's actually set himself back because he's he now takes, injured. Uh, well, you could argue regression is something new, I guess, but thematically not yeah. really. You'd like, no. not so much. No. The thing is, though, like when I say about going back and forth and progress, it's not just going in a straight line. You can also you know, go around different ways. It's not just simply like a sliding scale of, you know, zero to 100, like filling a progress bar in an MMO. Um, it, you know, Fawthin could divert from this, he could change, but that doesn't seem like the impression to me. He still wants to mm -hmm. fucking kill Askeladd, but he's no close to doing it at the, start of the episode, at the end of the episodes he was at the start. So that's again why I say that, to me, this episode is fun, it's enjoyable. Uh, it's almost as enjoyable as Doc's Disco, 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 Disco. Disco, 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 disco. Ah. Yeah. You really need to get, a, like, a rave light installed when that happens. <laughs> I, well, I'll be recording from a new location soon. I'm moving office again at the end of this week, next door. Is it to an actual disco? I hope that the motion sensor uh, is not blocked by objects in the room as it is here. 
So. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that you know it doesn't start saying, uh, "Put down your weapons. You have twenty seconds to comply." <laughs> that would be unfortunate. Please, but anyway, exit the building. All right. So yeah, I don't have any more else to add about the uh, anything else to about this episode. Uh, do you have anything else, Doc? Nope. I think we covered it. All right. Right. We have a patron question before we get to the racing, though, and this one comes again from Blinkaji. Um, Blinkaji has asked. Can you give me a play-by-play -play of a hypothetical Bjorn versus Forkel battle? I thought about this long and hard, by which I mean I fall back for two minutes, and I know exactly how this would play out. It would play out exactly the same way as a fight between Popeye and Bluto would in the classic cartoon. Which is to say that Popeye, i.e. Bjorn, would get the other big shit kicks out of him by uh, Forkel as Bluto. And then, after pinning him down and threatening to kill him, you know... Bjorn is going to reach into his pocket and you're going to hear the and he's not got spinach but he's got a mushroom in his hand. So he pops that mushroom <laughs> and he just powers up and he starts beating the ever living shit out of him. But then still loses and gets punched into the water. <laughs> oh, and in this, in this wretched uh, Popeye meets Finland saga adaptation, I'm just going to have to say that Ascalide is olive oil because fuck it. There's your, there's your nightmare fuel, motherfuckers. Enjoy that one. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, but there, that's that's literally how it would go down in my head. It would just have to be that he would get the crap kicks out of him until he chomps on a mushroom. Yeah, so the way I view it is, so he would, Bjorn would take a mushroom from the beginning, straight away. And so there, <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Uh, a few years ago, there was a match in New Japan Pro Wrestling uh, between Katsuyori Shibata and Tomohiro Ishii, and they're both two fucking hard men, tough as nails, <laughs> like, you know, uh, $2 steak tough, right? And uh, basically, at, oh, one point, at one point in the match, Shibata sits down cross-legged in the middle of the ring and invites Ishii to do the same which is weird during a wrestling match so Ishii sits down across from him and then Shibata slaps Ishii Ishii slaps Shibata across the face as hard as they can, draws blood from his mouth and then they just slap the shit out of each other for several minutes as hard as they can palm striking the ever living fuck out of each other's faces and this is how I see it going down in Vinland Saga between Bjorn and uh, Thorkel. Or, to use a more sort of relevant example in the medium, uh, in anime, in Yu Yu Hakusho, the first round of the Dark Tournament, there is... Uh, so the main character, Yusuke, and the person he's fighting, a uh, guy with a mohawk, who's a super cool guy called Cho, I think... But anyway, they both run out of spiritual power, so they're just regular guys. And so they decide <laughs> what they're going to do is put big knives in the ground and stand next to those knives so neither one of them can take a step back and punch the shit out of each other until someone gives. And that's what will happen. And Thorkel will eventually win because the mushroom effects will wear off. But they will punch each other yeah, exactly. for hours. That's, that, we we agree that's the linchpin on which that rests on. Yes. That it's, it's beyond mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Although if Falkel eats one of them, then he's totally fucked. <laughs> no, don't let it happen. Don't give him access to the stash. Whatever he Falkel does. smash! Puny I mean, Bjorn. He'll just throw, he'll throw a tree through the moon. <laughs> and the moon will crash on the earth. No, he'll he, bring he, about he, the apocalypse. He'll swing it. He'll swing it and hit Bjorn, and he'll send it flying into the air, Team Rocket style. Yes. Yep. He'll be a, uh, a, a, a glint in the atmosphere. Ding. Ah, uh, that. Well, that was a great question. Thank you for that, Blake. Thank you. That was good fun. Um, I, I, I will never bore of making Bjorn like shrimp jokes never. from Mario to you know Popeye. I will keep making them as long as you keep asking me to do. All right. Well, without further ado, then let's rate the episode. Uh, you know, the battle for London or the battleships of London Bridge, I guess we'll yep. call it. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, pass it over to you, Doc, first to rate. Uh, fire away, my good sir. Uh, great episode. You know, like I, I thought, a lot of entertainment value. 
did not, as you say, advance uh, the narrative in terms of theme, though we got a new character who was great. All in all, I was really pleased. I think the episode flew by. So uh, I'm going to give it uh, 4.25 Teachings of Christ out of 5. Nice, nice. All right, then. Uh, for me, well, you've already heard my opinions at length on it. It was still an enjoyable episode, don't get me wrong. I mean, you, we could, we'll could, we have to wait and see how things pan out more with 4Kel before I'm really willing to offer a conclusive statement on the, you know, Gundam uh, War is Hell problem, the contradiction there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nonetheless, what we saw this time was enjoyable. Uh, how can you go wrong with, like, you know, Viking battleships? That's some good shit right there. I'm totally in for that. Um... But yeah, not really much of wise advancement of the micro plot. We have more macro level stuff, but I'm okay with that. Maybe a bit of downtime is actually what's needed for the show rather than it constantly being, you know, so deep in its own like linear plot line. So in the end, take this rating is still a positive, even if it is lower than what you otherwise have heard from me previously about the show. I, in the end, will give uh, the Battle of London Bridge uh, 3.5, you know, B1 hits out of five. Fair enough. Fair enough. Still a good episode. Still a good episode, but there are better. That's true. That's fair. So uh, before we sign off, I want to quickly hit refresh to get the most up to date results on our current Twitter polls uh, for episode nine. Uh, does Thorkel love orange soda? <laughs> the choices are: Thorkel loves orange soda, and oh yes, oh yes, it's true. And he do, he do, he do, he do. Uh, currently, he do, he do, he do is in the lead with 83% of the vote. Second place is Thorkel Loves Orange Soda at 17%. Uh, oh, yes, oh, yes, it's true. Has no votes at the moment. Uh, should the subtle doctor stop attempting the Viking accent? Oh. Uh, no, not on open, never are the choices. Uh, <laughs> We in the first first ever Watery Death show in history, we have a, a 50-50 tie. Uh, parentheses, it's not the first time that's ever happened. Close parentheses. Um, <laughs> no and never are are winning with fifty uh, percent of the vote uh, splitting. Uh, and we have even more votes on the next poll, which is seriously though, should he stop? <laughs> and. 50% say yes, and 50% say no for real. Oh, man. Uh, and then our final poll, does Vinland Saga have a Gundam problem? Uh, parentheses, war is hell, but X element of war is pretty awesome. Uh, 60% say no, 40% say yes. Um, keep those votes coming in. We want to know what you think. Roll that shit in. <laughs> yes. You know, Get involved. Roll it in. Push that button. Uh, All right. How else can well, people get involved with our show? Well, uh, there's plenty of ways of doing that beyond just simply smashing buttons on a Twitter page. You can smash a button on our Patreon page to yeah. subscribe to us for as little as $2 a month. Get yourself early access to us talking currently about Given. Uh, we'll also be doing uh, other shows as well and requests. We've recently put out uh, my magnum opus of my entire podcast career. Uh, the show that, um, that just makes me think that, you know, all soda is the fucking work of the devil, which I suppose to some people it probably is. I mean, Nestle is pretty fucking evil. Uh, anyway, uh, that would be a Keegan, of course. Uh, I'm going to be now covering next up uh, Tokyo Godfathers, I believe, which mm-hmm. has been requested. Uh, I also have other essays lined up as well on stuff like uh, Kawakami from Persona 5. Expect me to be complaining about her, which I'm sure will not get let me not a little bit amount of grief, although it's not about her specifically. That's the that's the difference. <laughs> uh, and, and I've... I'll be I've uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. You finish. Um, I'm also covering a mystery awful show that Doc knows what it is, but I cannot even reveal what it is because I'm just going to drop it on all you like out of nowhere. Um, but what about you, Doc? What are you currently covering for the for the patrons? So I've been requested to talk about Kino's journey. I will. There is so much there that I'm going to do multiple uh, pieces of content about it. Um, I work much slower than Shadon. Shadon is efficient and a, a machine when it comes to analysis and criticism. Uh, getting my thoughts down on paper is much harder, which I've decided that for the, the current Kino's Journey project, I'm going to script it rather than do freeform, which is what I've done previously. 
Um, so it has taken time, but uh, hopefully it'll be worth it. We'll, we will see if you think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like it. I think, uh, I, I think the ideas there are interesting enough on their own merit that whatever kind of spin I put on them, I mean, who cares? The ideas are just interesting. Um, so there's, there's that. There's Kino's Journey. I've, I have talked about Astro Boy, the 1980s uh, Astro Boy. I've talked about Spider Gwen. And, uh, but yeah, I expect uh, Kino's Journey as well as we've got other requests in the pipeline for me to cover down the road as well. There's a lot of great content for you to subscribe uh, to Patreon Indeed. for. Absolutely. And if you want to request your own shows to discover, be they, you know, masterpieces or masterpieces of shit, as it turns out. <laughs> I mean, we know who's. We know. We all know at this point which of us two is getting those. Yeah, I almost got one, but I think someone thought better of, of it. Unfortunately for me. Well, good for you. <laughs> I'm not. Well, I'm isn't not. That uh, just great. <laughs> I am not adverse to covering bad shows. Let me just. I will say that. I. I too I'm also not adverse to covering good shows as it happens. <laughs> Just to throw Tokyo out Godfathers there. is very good. You will love it. I, I'm looking forward to it. All right, but yes, if you want to get involved in that, then feel free to send over to our Patreon. If you're not uh, taking part in our Patreon and want to help us out otherwise, uh, leave us a like or a comment on you know iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, subscribe, etc. All that good stuff. It all helps our discoverability. All helps with us, you know, being found by algorithms and you know the other Skynets of the internet and all that kind of <laughs> shit. So yeah, please feel free to get involved that way. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll return later this week with Given for patrons, and we'll be back uh, with episode 10 of Vinland Saga next week. Vin 10. Uh, Vin 10, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that I'm, funny? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm on that uh, completely random note, uh, I will bid you all a very good evening. Have a fantastic day and rest of the week, folks. And as always, uh, I'm Shaden. That's the subtle doctor. Occasionally, when he, you know, Disbands the gets rid of the middle last name. As ever, embrace your everyone. It's the end of the universe. See you later.